let's turn to our Bibles uh, to the book of Habakkuk. If you don't know where that is, that's okay. It's after Nahum. I hope that helps. <laughs> it's somewhere in the Old Testament. I don't know where to tell you. Just, just go find it. Um, but the book of Habakkuk, it, uh, the Lord kind of just put this on my heart. I, I haven't really taught this book in a long time. If Maybe I haven't even taught it before. I've read it numerous times. But it kind of fits with today's culture, um, clearly does. I mean, God's word is timeless. It doesn't change. But when you read the pages of Habakkuk, you really are like reading the news, the headlines. And uh, we're going to look at the pages of God's word in this minor prophet. We're going to take a break in 1 Samuel. Pastor Gary's going to pick that up next week. But I, I really felt the Lord was really just tugging my heart to share um, this passage of scripture with, with you all and to study this together. And so we're going to be in the whole book of Habakkuk and I've entitled uh, today's message, Don't Worry About the Wicked. Don't worry about the wicked. So let us pray and then we're going to dive in. God, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for this church that we can just come and settle our hearts and Lord, some of us have just come from work, uh, come, some of us come from school and jobs and routines and just family time, Lord, and so we just want to come here midweek and just be before your feet. Uh, we want to hear from you. Please speak to us clearly by your Holy Spirit. Lord, for those that are in this auditorium, this sanctuary, that don't know you, Lord, would they leave here just a little bit changed? God, that they would have their hearts just somewhat open now to your word, that that veil that Paul talks about that blinds our eyes would be removed. So God, we, we know that your word will not return void. It will accomplish just the purpose that it's sent. And so God, we pray that you would just do that very thing tonight, that you would accomplish your purpose. So we love you, we praise you, and just... Open our minds and our hearts for what you have for us today. Thank you for the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. A question that's been asked for centuries has been, if God exists, why do bad things happen? Right? I'm sure all of us have heard that. Maybe some of you have struggled with that question. Or for the believer, if God exists, which I hope you believe he does, why do the wicked so often prosper? Why does it seem like the wicked get away with things, right? I mean, you don't have to just go too far. You can turn on the, the news and see it just feels like the wicked is prevailing. It feels like there's injustice. And Habakkuk was asking these, these questions. And now, it may seem to us that they're prospering. It may seem to us that the wicked are getting away with things. But God is in control, and he is keeping an account. He is going to keep an account and judge the good and the bad deeds that we do. He knows everything. He knows everything that's going on. And Habakkuk had these concerns. Habakkuk was preaching during the last days of Judah before its fall to Babylon in 586 BC. So Habakkuk is probably preaching around 600 BC. And the book of Habakkuk is actually structured, it's only three chapters, but it's structured like a Q&A session between the prophet Habakkuk and God himself. A little Q&A session, all right? that Habakkuk is asking some questions. And it concludes in chapter three with this prayer of praise to the Lord. So it ends well, but the first two chapters are, are heavy and asking God question after question. And Habakkuk asks God two main questions. And God's gonna answer Habakkuk's questions. God always answers our questions. Now his answers may not be in our timing, they're in his timing, and the answer that Habakkuk was looking for, actually some of God's answers didn't even happen in Habakkuk's lifetime. It's actually futuristic, and I'm going to talk about that for a little bit, that it's even futuristic for us today. But what God is going to say is going to challenge Habakkuk. Habakkuk's name, his name in Hebrew means one who embraces or clings. I love that. Because he would embrace and cling to the Almighty God at the end of this book. His name is going to be so appropriate when we finish this, that he clung to the Lord. He would embrace the Lord. 
Paul would say in 1 Timothy 1.19, it's on the screen, cling to your faith in Christ. Keep your conscience clear. For some people have deliberately violated their consciences and as a result, their faith has been shipwrecked. It's a powerful verse. And what is Paul telling us? He's saying, first cling to your faith in Christ. Stay to Jesus, stay with him. And your conscience has to be clear at all times. As much as you can handle that, like try to make your conscience clear at all times. But that only starts with clinging to the Lord. Because he tells us that there are gonna be people who will violate their conscience. They're gonna compromise and give in to sin. And then their, shipwreck, their faith will then be shipwrecked. And it's not a pretty picture. And I want, I want this to minister at our hearts as we study this book because it's so applicable. When it's all said and done, this is what I wanna get out of teaching this passage. We can ultimately praise God's wisdom even though we do not fully understand his ways. That is so true of the entire gospel, of the entire Bible. We, we can praise God and his wisdom that he knows what he's doing even though we don't understand his ways. And that's what Habakkuk is saying. I don't understand, Lord, what you're doing and I, I'm trying to wrap my mind around it, but I, you're such a good God, why? Why is this happening? But then Habakkuk at the end said, I, I can still praise the Lord because I know he's good and just and wise and he loves me. I don't understand everything, but I'm still gonna praise him. We have to cling to this. This is so true. So let's read Habakkuk chapter one. I wanna just read the first four verses, and then we'll kind of glance through some other verses, and then we'll finish the whole book. It's not that long. The burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw, and that word burden can also mean prophecy or message, but any message that a prophet would give would be a burden. This is so true. Verse two, O Lord, how long shall I cry? The Hebrew word for cry can also mean scream. How long shall I cry or scream and you will not hear? I even cry out to you violence and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore the law is powerless. Some translations say paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, therefore perverse judgment proceeds. Habakkuk is gonna ask two questions, and the first question we're gonna look at that he sees and asks God is why are you allowing sin and injustice to continue? Boy, isn't this so applicable for today? Time has not changed, right? You watch the news, you watch the media, you see what's going on in government in Washington, D.C just in our own backyard, we can ask the same question. Why does it seem like injustice is prevailing and people get away with sin and people get away with this and that, it's corrupt. This was 2,600 years ago in, in Habakkuk's time. But that question he asks is so true for us. Why, God, are you allowing this sin and injustice to continue? Look what he says in verse four again. Therefore, the law is powerless, it's paralyzed. So it, that really, that Hebrew word is really means it's cold, it's chilled, it's, it's numb. The law, it's, it's paralyzed and justice never goes forth. There's, there's wicked surrounding the righteous. Perverse judgment proceeds. Well, I mean, we think it's bad today and it is. I think there's so much corruption that happens in a lot of governments. A lot of behind the scenes sin and evil that's going on. I mean, but this was happening in Habakkuk's day. It's been going on for centuries. We, we think it's just... It's just gotten worse. I, it might have been worse than then. And Habakkuk is ask, asking an appropriate question. Why are you allowing sin and injustice to continue, God? God would answer him then in verse five and six. It's on the screen. For I am doing something in your own day, says the Lord, something you wouldn't believe in even if someone told you about it. I am raising up the Babylonians. See, God had a plan in mind on how to punish the sin and wickedness and injustice that was happening in Habakkuk's day. Now, Habakkuk didn't see that. He didn't under, understand why, why is God allowing this? God says, look, you may think that I'm allowing it and they're going to get away with it, but they're not. I am raising up the Babylonians. They're going to be my instrument. They're, they're going to take over and invade your land because the Assyrians were pretty much conquering that land right now, but then the Babylonian empire <laughs> would then take over and conquer the Assyrians and then take over Jerusalem as well. 
But look what he says. He says, I'm doing something in your own day, something you wouldn't believe, even if someone told you about it, Habakkuk. Like, there's something that you don't know what I'm doing that, that I know. You can question and complain all you want, but rest assured, I have a plan. What did God tell the people in Isaiah 55, 8 through 9? My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. My ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Everyone know that verse? Isaiah 55, it's a great verse. And Isaiah is being told, he's, he's proclaiming this to the people, hey, God's ways and his thoughts are not your ways and thoughts. You might think you have something that is the better plan, but God says, I've got a better plan in mind that you don't even know about. And my thoughts that I know are not your thoughts. And I'm so thankful that God has a plan every time and for every purpose. God sees and knows exactly what's going on in the world. And here's where I think he's very merciful to us. The more that you and I would be exposed to what is going on in our world and like in the deep, dark state and like what's going on in the shadows behind the scenes, I don't think that we could actually handle it. I think we would be extremely overwhelmed, possibly physically sick. Can you imagine what God is seeing? God is seeing it all. Now, I question that same thing. Why is God allowing all that to happen? Why can't he just stop it? You can ask that in a lot of passages in the Bible. Why didn't God stop this? Why didn't God prevent that? I've struggled with that in my own life, not, as a, not just in my pastoral ministry, but as a Christian. Why, why, did God, why did God not protect that person, but they protected me? Why, why did that happen? Why did that thing happen to that person? Why, why did that person feel like they got ripped off, but that other person got off scot-free. Like, it's a question that I think a lot of us may struggle with. Still to this day, I've always wondered, man, why, why did God prevent something like that to happen to me, but yet he allowed it to happen to that person? You ever thought of it that way? And we can, we can wonder and question, like, God, why? You think of when soldiers, when they come back from war, I mean, it's real what they're going through, that depression. And then there's sometimes where they're thinking, why did God, if they're a believer, allow my friend to die, but I'm alive? Why? I mean, we can ask God this all the time, but God says, behind the scenes, I'm working. We do live in a fallen, depraved, sick world, but God says, I'm always working, I'm sovereign. He's not taking a back seat. He is in control. And he will use sometimes things that, this, that Satan wants to do for his own good. God will turn that and use it for his glory. And you've heard sometimes that phrase, what your mess is, God, it's God's message. God will take that and use it for good. But again, I'm, I'm glad that God is somewhat shielded our eyes and has guarded our hearts because I, I believe if we knew everything that's going on, it, we could not handle it. But God can. God's a big God. But he also, it breaks his heart. He also tells us in his word that he is displeased with sin. It hurts him. And then second question that Habakkuk would ask would be number two, how could you use, how could God use a wicked people as punishment. So this is what God is doing. So God says, I'm raising up the Babylonians, and here's what's going to happen, Habakkuk. I'm going to use them, a wicked nation, an evil people, to punish my people. They're, they're going to receive a punishment that's going to last for 70 years. Some of them would be killed by the sword, and then some would be taken into captivity. So then if it's not bad enough for Habakkuk, then he's like, okay, wait, hold on. He asks the first question, God answers. The second question, he says, wait, you, you, hold on, a follow-up question, God. You just said you're going to use the Babylonians. You understand who they are? You're going to use them to punish us? Wait, why can't you punish them first? Punish the Babylonians first. Why do you have to use them for, to take, to, you know, to mess with us? And God says, I, I have a plan. 
I know what I'm doing. God answers him in chapter 2, verse 4. Behold, the proud, which is the Babylonians, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. See, I know what I'm doing. I know that the Babylonians are this evil, proud, wicked people, and they were. I mean, when you've, got, you've got Nineveh and Babylon um, that are a part of that, that Chaldean Babylonian era, area, and you've got the prophet Jonah, for example, that had nothing to do with Nineveh. He had wanted nothing to do with them, and he did not want them to get saved. He said, they deserve punishment and death. God says, I still love them, and I need you to go after them. He says, nope, I'm going the other way. Sorry, God, you can get somebody else. And God's like, no, I'm going to teach you a lesson, Jonah, and I love that people, and they need to hear me. And then for Habakkuk, Habakkuk is, is saying, God, th th this Babylonian nation, surely you know, and you cannot look, and you cannot wink at sin. You know what they do. So why are you allowing them to take over us? Just, can you just please just deal with us on our own level? Don't use them. They need to be punished. But God says, I'm going to use the proud Babylonians who are not good, they will be destroyed, their time will come to an end, but I want you as my just and righteous people to live by faith. Now, where have we seen that verse before? There's three times that this verse, the just or the righteous shall live by faith, three times in the New Testament, Romans chapter one, Galatians three, and then Hebrews 10. Paul would write those in Romans and Galatians and the writer of Hebrews would use it in chapter 10, right before the hall of faith. Now what you have here in Hebrew is the word just, just really means righteous or right before God. So the righteous person is a just person. The Hebrew phrase shall live or live means to cause to grow, to revive, or to restore. God is wanting us to grow, to be revived, to be restored. And then faith in the Hebrew means firmness or steadfastness in regard to reliance, not just believing. Because we also have read in James, that the demons believe who God is and they shudder. It is not about a believing, that is part of it, it is about relying on that person that you believe in. You are trusting now with a confident faith. It's not some mysterious, uh, wishful thinking, it is concrete, this faith. And that's what it means, it's steadfastness, it's firm. Look, God would deal with Babylon and they would not get away with anything. God was gonna deal with them as well. That would come later. You've heard the phrase, trust me, I know what I'm doing, right? <laughs> trust me, I know what I'm doing. That only really applies to God. If you hear that from anybody else, it's usually not good because people don't use their promises. If you hear the president say, trust me, I know what I'm doing. No. The go any government saying, trust me, we know what we're doing, we're here to help. Okay, thank you. You've got a friend or a loved one says, trust me, I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. You may think you know what you're doing, you don't really know what you're doing. I just thought of this in the, the, the Princess Bride. I don't think you actually know what that thing means. <laughs> it's a great movie. Anyway, God's going to deal with Babylon, but God can say, trust me, I know what I'm doing. I know exactly what I'm doing. I want to break down these terms, the just, and then shall live, and by his faith, because this is where it appears in the different parts of the New Testament. The just, Paul would mention that in Romans 1.17. Now, what is Romans all about? Justified. You are justified by your faith. Justification. So the just, the righteous, shall, shall live by faith. Paul made that clear in Romans 1.17. Galatians 3.11 talks about living by the Spirit, not by the law. So then Paul would use that same Habakkuk passage, the just shall live, live by the Spirit, not by the law anymore. The law can't save you, and you're not, we're not to live through the law. We're to live through the Spirit. And then last, by his faith, Hebrews 10, 38, we talk about your faith in God has to be so strong because look at the people that have gone before you. That's Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith. By faith, by faith, Abraham, Moses, and the list goes on. They had this concrete hope and faith and steadfastness that they knew what God was doing even though they didn't know the outcome. So it's beautifully written in the pages of the New Testament. So Paul would use this phrase in Habakkuk 2, 4, and God would say, hey, look, the just, the righteous will live by faith, not by sight. It's not by what we see, but it's our faith that we need to walk in.
It's that faith that is going to lead us into a relationship with Jesus. We can trust and know what God is doing. But again, we don't understand it all, but we know that he's good. We know that he's trustworthy. We know that he's faithful. He's never broken a promise. He's fulfilled every prophecy in the Old Testament. He is so trustworthy. But I know sometimes we're hurt by other people that have wronged us. So I can't trust you anymore. You've sinned against me. I don't want anything to do with you. Why would God allow that? I have to keep walking and walking by faith. It's the only way. Now, before we close with chapter three, because mainly of chapter one and two, it's the question and answer back and forth that God has with Habakkuk. But chapter three is really what I want to hone in on. I think it's good to make note that in, in all of Habakkuk's complaining, he did not sin. And that's good to know. Because that tells us something. It tells us that we can complain and ask questions to our Heavenly Father. You ever thought of that? Sometimes may, you maybe have heard growing up like, hey, just don't complain with God. Don't question Him. And I understand there's, there's the stories of the Exodus and there's stories of people whining and complaining and God's like, hey, I have, my patience is really high, but you are hitting that, that level now. But there's something I think the Lord loves with His children to come to Him and ask questions even complain. And those of you that have kids, you understand, like kids are going to complain, they're going to whine, they're going to act out, they're going to question. Why? I have a two-year-old right now, she's almost three, Emma, and uh, she's in this phase now where everything's why. Why? Well, I, well, and as a, as a dad or a mom for my wife, we have, to, we have to kind of explain on her terms. And other times I just want to be like, okay, here it goes, because dad said so. I can finally say it. <laughs> But it's why, why, why? I, look, I, I don't know. That's like in the Frozen movie, Olaf. Why, 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 why? I'm like, oh, that movie, that movie bugs me anyway. Sorry. Because um, we watch it all the time. Um, my point is, Habakkuk is complaining and questioning the Lord. However, take note of this. Habakkuk asked God questions. He did not question who God is. And that is huge. There's a big difference. You and I can question God and ask Him questions, but we cannot question who He is. Because this is what it's led to, really, in our young adult generation. Part of my millennial generation and then Gen Z that is happening right now. Complaining will lead to questioning. Questioning usually leads to doubting. Doubting leads to drifting. And drifting leads to disbelieving. This is a slippery slope that I've seen in our culture. Have you ever heard of the term deconstructing your faith? Google it or YouTube it. There's a lot of Christian artists, musically, those that write books, even some pastors that are using that phrase, deconstructing their faith. What led to that? What does that even mean? They're taking pics, pics of the Bible, they're taking little portions of the Bible ripping it out, saying that's not even true. You can't do that. You can't add to the Bible. You can't take away from the Bible. It's the whole counsel of God. And here's my thing. Are any of these too far from the Lord to where they can't receive forgiveness? No way. And again, for those of us that complain, we're human. We're going to complain. That's not really a sin. Questioning even God, that's not a sin. When we start to doubt, we do know some Bible characters that doubted. It's okay that doubt may creep into your heart and mind to where you start wondering, like, is the Bible really true? I've had that. I've had that in my life. I remember as a young high schooler, even in my 20s, just would creep in my mind thinking, is the Bible really the absolute word of God? And I'm thinking, where did that even come from? Sometimes from the enemy, sometimes it's whoever I'm hanging out with, the influence I'm listening to, the books I'm reading. We gotta be careful with this. I think it's okay in a way that you may struggle with some of these doubts, but then the more you give into those doubts, the more Hebrews chapter one and two tells us that we start to drift. And the Bible says, it makes it clear, do not drift. Because when you drift, 
we're going to be open and vulnerable to any ideology out there. And after that, people said, you know what? I don't even believe it anymore. I'm done. And we have examples of that in the New Testament. Paul would say many people that stopped following him and you know, the mission for Christ and would leave and follow after the world. There are examples. And I think if any of us have gone through these and you've gone to the point maybe where you're like, you know what, I'm just in disbelief. You know where that started? I think it was just small, some little complaint that you had with the Lord. And I think we've all gone through that. We've all had complaints. But a disbelief doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't. You don't just wake up the next day and say, you know, I just don't believe in God anymore. That has to start from somewhere. You're either feeding into the enemy, you're listening to whatever fake news is telling you, you're listening to whatever celebrities out there, Hollywood or sports, that are not of the Lord, and they've got the better ideology, they've got the better plan for your life. And I hate to say this now, but some celebrity pastors are going down that slope as well. But it all started, I think, with a small little complaint. Now Habakkuk, his complaints went right to God. That's what you and I need to do. Don't tweet him out. Go to his word. Don't start a Facebook group. Go to his word. Don't, don't write it out for the world to see so that you're complaining and that people will be like, oh, I feel you, I feel you. This is what happened too. There's, there's a trend going around right now too that kind of started maybe five years ago of people that are talking about what did the church do wrong for me? And here's what my church did, how they wronged me. And then other people are gonna tag on to it and be like, that's what my church did too. Here's what my church also did. Has anybody seen this kind of buzz going around? I think it happened maybe five years ago, maybe it's still going on. It's where I was wronged by my church. Look, I don't know every situation or scenario, but God does. That's just not the place to the vent. Where's the place to vent? It's through prayer. Now, you can, you can go to any pastor that maybe you feel like a pastor's wronged you, or you come from another church that you felt like just wronged you. Look, that is between you and the church or the pastor and the Lord. But I just, I, I ask and I plead that there's no reason to go straight to the internet and to social media and talk about it. If Habakkuk was here in this day, would he have done that? I, don't, I hope not. I don't think so. The believer needs to always go straight to God's word. That's where you're going to hear his message. That's where you're going to hear his truth. It's God's word. I don't care where you turn to. We're in Habakkuk, for goodness sake. Like, some of you didn't even know that book existed. <laughs> God's word is God's word. And what we can hear from any pages, from Genesis to Revelation, is God's word. It's truth. Well, Pastor Tyler, I don't know where to start. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Just don't start in Leviticus. Don't do, don't do that. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But I've seen the trend, and maybe it's because I'm a youth pastor. I've seen it in high schoolers. I've seen it. And again, I struggled with this when I was in high school. The, the, the slippery slope from complaining to disbelief. The Gen Z... Uh, generation right now is probably the biggest ever of those that walk away from their faith and leave the church altogether once they reach college. A teenager. Once they reach college, it is only going up. That they're done with church, they're done with the Bible, they're done with God. Why is that? It's got to start somewhere. I don't think social media is helping. But I think some of us, we're hurt, we're broken people, we have complaints with the Lord, but some of us, we take our complaints somewhere else, and we don't give it to the Lord. But God is a God of restoration, and He can take us, if you're in any of these categories, right now in this state, He can take you away from it, and He can forgive you. You can cling to Him, as Habakkuk did. As we conclude in chapter 3, I want us to look at verse 1. I'm going to read verse 1, and then I'm going to read verse 16 and the rest of the, of the chapter. And I just want to hear Habakkuk's heart now, because Habakkuk's, 
The narrative has shifted. He knows exactly who God is. He knows who God is. He's a prophet. He had an awesome, intimate relationship with the Lord. Where the Lord would speak to him, and yet he still questioned and asked God, why? why? Why is all this happening? Why are you allowing sin to happen? Why are you going to use a wicked nation to punish us? But in, God, in his prayer, he flips. Um, he's going the other direction, and he says here in verse 1, a prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet of a Shiganoth, and that's really just a musical term. Um, this is most likely a song that would have been sung. O Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. Jump to verse 16. When I, when I heard, my body trembled. My lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he comes up to the people, he will invade them with his troops. Keep reading. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on my high hills. It's an amazing conclusion that Habakkuk would see, and I want us to be reminded of these three things as we close. Habakkuk's prayer or his song can be divided into three parts. And we're gonna see here in verses one through 15, Number one, we're reminded of the past. Now, what do I mean by that? I'm talking about in terms of God's faithfulness, mercy, and salvation. If you can look back and know what God has done in your life and count your blessings, you've heard that term, you will always be praising the Lord and saying thank you so much for your mercy back then, your salvation back then, your faithfulness back then. That's what Habakkuk is talking about. In the most of the, of the chapter of three, verses two through 15, if you wanna read that when you go home, it's an image of God, the Lord, it is a warrior. He is a warrior and it's Habakkuk looking back at the time of their deliverance from Egypt, out of Egypt into the promised land. He's gonna look back at that time, even though he wasn't there, it was his ancestors. The way God was a warrior and he used plagues, he wiped out his enemies in the wilderness, he conquered giants in the promised land. God, you were faithful and just, and you freed us from Egypt. Now when I look actually, and this is where I was talking about that some of Habakkuk is even futuristic for us. In chapter three, um, most scholars would believe, and I, I tend to believe this as well, that we're looking into a future time when Jesus himself comes at his second coming. There's gonna be a time when Jesus uh, before the time of the Mount of Olives even, that the Bible in Isaiah chapter 63 talks about Christ coming to Basra, which is Petra. And he will free and rescue the remnant of Jews that finally put their faith and trust in Jesus after fleeing from the Antichrist. This is this chapter, Habakkuk 3. There will be a remnant of Jews that believe and re realize we've been duped by the Antichrist and they're gonna flee and run. That's why Jesus says, flee to the wilderness, run when you see the abomination that causes desolation. So that's, again, a whole different story, but this chapter of Habakkuk 3 is even talking about that, when Christ comes to free the remnant of Jews that finally trust in him. Isaiah 63, Matthew 24, 16, and it's also Revelation chapter 12. But we see Jesus is, he's a warrior. He's a warrior. And he fought, even Jude says that it was Jesus that fought and delivered the Israelites out of slavery, which he's equating Jesus is God. But I think we need to be reminded of God and how God has been faithful, merciful, and when he saved us. You look back at that time, that moment, that date, that some of you know exactly the date when you got saved. You can look back and remember where you were, what you were wearing, who was with you. You can remember that time. Because that time... God changed your life. 
And Habakkuk is saying, Lord, I've heard your speech and I was afraid. Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. Remember your mercy, because I remember who you are. I know who you are. You're a God of mercy, justice, righteousness, and love. And he's a God that saves. We can look back and remember that time that Christ saved us. Number two, in verse 16, we see that it's rest for the future. While the answer satisfied Habakkuk in verses 2 through 15, the thought of a Babylonian invasion of his people also left him physically exhausted. He's overwhelmed. Look what it says in verse 16. When I heard about all this stuff that's going to happen, my body trembled, my lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered my bones. I trembled in myself. But nevertheless, the prophet says that he could rest in the day of trouble or wait quietly because he knew the Lord would judge righteously. That is my plea for us today. Whoever has wronged you, whatever injustice has happened to you, God will right the wrongs eventually. He will. He has to judge sin. They cannot get away with it. You probably have heard countless stories of just people that were wronged or taken advantage of or, or robbed. Any, any kind of sin that someone has committed on you. Jesus said, pray for that. Pray for that enemy. They're an enemy to you, but they're not an enemy to the Lord. You can rest in the future knowing that God is going to right the wrongs. We can rest assured that though hard, difficult trials may come, we know that the Lord is sovereign and in control and he will use it for his good. Tyler, I don't know how God is going to use this for my good. He will. He will. He might even save somebody else. Someone else is going to be affected by it because they're going to see the mercy and faithfulness that God did in your life through that. And again, your mess can become your message, your testimony, your story of how God saved you and took you out of that that situation, even though someone wronged you. God's going to use it somehow for good. We can always ask the question, why God, why? But James chapter 1 verse 2 tells us, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Count it all joy when you go through trials and temptations and tribulations. What? Why can I be joyful in that? That that doesn't sound right, Lord, but the testing of our faith will produce perseverance and patience. We can know that we have a future hope in heaven and that there will be rest someday for all eternity. But for now, the past is the past. Be reminded of what God did in your past. Forget the wrong and evil that happened. I know it's hard to forget but we have to press on and pray for your enemies. Pray for those that have wronged you. I've had to pray for those that have wronged me or have just indirectly affected me. Maybe you have family members that have just caused division, divorce, their sexual sin, whatever the case is. Sin hurts, right? It breaks people. It tears people apart. And sin separates us from a holy God. That's why God sent Jesus and the cross to make a way. Because we're all broken people. And we need this rest that God says is going to happen in the future. David said in Psalm 37, 7, be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Can we wait patiently? Last but not least, we can do this, what, what Habakkuk did, rejoice in the present. We can always rejoice. And sometimes I hate those verses that Paul talks about in Philippians, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Stop it, Paul, really? He was in prison when he wrote that. He was in prison. And he's saying rejoice. That just blows my mind. Because I don't think we could do that. I just don't know how that, Paul had such an intimate relationship with the Lord that he could say in Philippians 3, 1, whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. I never get tired of telling you these things. Ah. He says, I never get tired of telling you these things, and I do it to safeguard your faith. Whatever happens, rejoice in the Lord. You don't have to rejoice in the sin that was committed on you. You don't rejoice in that. You rejoice that the Lord is faithful and merciful, and he's going to take you out from that. He's going to bring healing somehow. He will. And it might not be immediate. It might be down the road. But don't ever think, oh, i got to rejoice over that sin. You don't rejoice over the sin. You pray for that sinner. Pray for them. But God will make you a better person because of it. He will. 
Just trust him and rejoice now of what he is going to do. Habakkuk is going to say, no matter what's happening, although I don't know why this is happening or what God's up to, I'm going to still rejoice. That's why he uses all those phrases. The fig may not be blossoming, the the olive may fail, the the fields are yielding no food, there may be be no herd in the stalls. He's talking about crops and farming. He's like, if if none of this stuff happens, if your finances, your marriage, your your business, if if stuff seems to be failing... God can work it all out for good. He can turn it around and we can still rejoice and know that he's on the throne and he's got something up his sleeve. He knows what he's doing. I want to close with Psalm of David, Psalm 37. You can turn there if you'd like, but I believe it's on the screen. We can look at it together. Psalm 37, and I hand select, this Psalm was amazing. I mean, if you haven't read Psalm 37 in a long time, you need to read it. But Psalm 37 David would pretty much talk about the wicked versus the righteous. Don't let it take you down. I hand selected 37 verses 1 through 2, 7, 9, and 18. I want to read it out loud. David would say, don't worry about the wicked or envy those who do wrong. For like grass, they soon fade away. Like spring flowers, they soon wither. Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. For the wicked will be destroyed, but those who trust in the Lord will possess the land. Day by day, the Lord takes care of the innocent. I love that. God knows who the innocent are. Those who've been wronged or taken advantage of. Day by day, the Lord takes care of them. And they will receive an inheritance that lasts forever, the hope of heaven. Paul says these light and momentary troubles, man, they don't even compare to the glory that far outweighs them all. I can't wait for that day. Don't worry about the wicked church. Don't worry about them. Pray for them. Pray for them. Even make it personal. If you've got someone that you don't like that's an enemy of yours in the workforce, a neighbor, even a family member called your in-laws, no, I'm kidding. That was a joke. You've got an enemy somewhere. We all do. Pray for them. But I had a high schooler ask me this a couple weeks ago, and I'll close. Kind of came out of nowhere. We were at a bonfire night, and, you know, we're just hanging out with the kids, and the student was kind of waiting to talk for me the whole time. His parents were going through a divorce. I had no idea. You know, pray, pray for these high schoolers. Um, my heart, you know, my heart breaks for them. Um, but he came up to me and said, my parents are going through this divorce. He said, my mom knows Jesus. I don't believe my dad does, but I feel, feel like my dad is just, everything's going right with him and He's prospering, he's doing well, my mom seems to be suffering. Why is God allowing this? This is about, a, I don't know, a couple months ago. Man, I'm trying to ask the Lord, what do you want me to say? What do you want me to say? I, I told him, honestly, there are things that I don't know. Um, but I know one thing, and the Lord just kind of ministered in my heart, and I just had to tell him, you need to, you need to pray for your mom and dad. Just pray for them. The Lord sees everything. He knows, and he knows your heart, and I think there was a reason that you came up to me to even talk to me about this. And I was trying to find a solution and trying to find the best Bible verse as a youth pastor and be like, yeah, here's what you can do. The Lord said, just, just tell them to pray. So I close with this, you know. The wicked may seem like they're getting off scot-free. We're to pray for them, but they're not. There will be judgment. They will be held accountable. But you need to do your part and just pray for whoever's wronged you and to press on and to ask for forgiveness. That's, that's it. I know that's hard. But that's, that's what we have to do for healing. And so I, I, I prayed with that young man and 
It was just a sweet time. You know, but even he was questioning, why, why is God allowing this to happen? Why is God allowing evil to prevail, it feels like, and then this suffering to happen? I don't have all the answers, just like Habakkuk says, Lord, I don't know what you're doing, but you're doing something good. And so I want to bow in our hearts and pray and just ask the Lord to help us not to worry about the wicked and evil in this world, but that God would just guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus, and we would have a heart to pray for those that are lost, to pray for those, because we don't fight and wrestle against flesh and blood. Ephesians chapter 6, we wrestle against the principalities and the darkness of this world. It's a satanic influence at times. We got to pray for the lost. Would you bow your heads and pray with me right now? God in heaven, we thank you for your word. And no, this is a heavy, humble topic. Lord, we, we don't have all the answers. Some of us in this room, we have been wrestling with bitterness and unforgiveness for a long time. There has been someone that has wronged that person and it feels like the person got away scot-free. Everything's going right with them. But Lord, why do I feel like I keep suffering? Why are you allowing good or why are you allowing evil to prosper? Feels like it, Lord. God says, Habakkuk, I have a plan. My ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. You have no idea what I'm up to. I will judge sin. I will judge sin. God, we thank you that you're a good, faithful, just God and that you will right the wrongs. There will be that day that you return and establish your millennial kingdom and right all the wrongs that have ever been committed. But until that day, Lord, until that day, may we just press on. May our, may our faith strengthen us in you. The just will live by faith. God, we thank you that we can complain, we can question, we can ask you questions. But Lord, I pray for this generation or you, anyone in this room that is starting to drift away and that just the complaints and the questions, they just keep dwelling on it to where doubt creeps in. We've, they, we've given Satan a foothold now. Don't give Satan a foothold, the Bible says. Guard your heart. God, I pray that we would just not look at the circumstances that have happened, that we would just ultimately press on, pray for those that are lost, and glorify you in the process. Because we trust that you have a plan. We can question you, but we don't question who you are. We know that you're good. Your Bible tells us that. Thank you, God, for your word. Thank you for your son, Jesus, that died for every sin that was ever committed, that knows all the sins that happen. But God, we do ask that you would come quickly, that you would right the wrongs, but until then, God, give us grace for those that are lost. Give us grace and patience. Help us to persevere, Lord. We love you. We thank you. Bring us back safely on Sunday and next Wednesday. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen, amen and amen.